Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar um, today. Uh, we are covering topics on tuition, financial aid, and financial wellness, so we're, we're excited to have you join us. My name's Andrea Thomas. I'm the Chief Experience Officer here at the University of Utah, and um, I have three guests who will each be speaking um, to us. Um, I'd like to welcome Ashley Stevenson, who's our Interim Director of Scholarships, Henry um, Newton, the associate accountant in the office of the bursar, they handle tuition payments. Um, and then Elsa Osborne, who's a program coordinator in our financial wellness center. And um, each of them will be speaking to us today on topics of interest for students who are first time students or continuing students. Um, I, uh, before we get going on the presentations, I wanted to let you know how how to, to ask questions. So if you look in the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button. You can, you can click that button and type in your question, and then I will be monitoring the questions, and um, be, I'll be asking them to the presenters. We will take questions while they're presenting on the topic that they're talking about, but if you have questions that e even after we've moved on to another presenter, just type them in and we'll do a Q&A section at the end. Um, so we'll make Make sure that we have ample opportunity to answer the questions that you have. Uh, if you have a really specific question, I might end up typing a message back to you asking for contact information for somebody to reach out to you. So if it's a if it's an individual question versus a broader question for the whole group, um, we might end up answering that in a follow up manner. So I um, just want to let you know to kind of keep an eye once you ask. Um, ask the question, keep an eye on the re responses. Um, also, we are recording this session and it will be available for you. Um, we'll upload it in the next day or so to belong.utah.edu. This is a place for students and their um, families and supporters to have all the information kind of aggregated for things that they might want to know. So we have checklists for you. We have links to other part of our websites. And then when you look on the menu, there's a webinar section that we have all the archived webinars that we um, we talk about. Um, and so you'll have access to the presentation, to all the questions, all of that uh, information. When you go to belong.utah.edu as well, there is a place where you can ask additional questions there that we monitor. And that's not just for topics that we're covering on this webinar, but that's general questions that you might have. Um, we'll uh, make sure that that we get that question to the person that can answer it for you. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to Ashley, who's going to, uh, to start us off. And I'm gonna have Trish um, go ahead and um, start the presentation so that you can see the slides. So thank you very much, Ashley. We'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Andrea. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Andrea said, I'm the I'm Ashley Stevenson. I'm the um, interim director of scholarships here in our office. Um, so in these slides, um, in the next slide, we're going to go ahead and start talking about financial aid. And also later in the presentation, we'll talk about um, scholarships that are available here at the U. So um, on the next slide, we're going to go over types of financial aid for your students. So there's two different types of federal financial aid and financial aid basis for students that come to campus. The first one is considered our need-based financial aid. So anything that's considered need-based on campus um, requires your students to fill out a 24-25 FAFSA on file. And as some of you may know, with the delay of the FAFSA this year, um, it has been a little bit tricky to have students kind of fill it out, but students are still able to fill out their FAFSAs online right now. And depending on if they are independent or dependent students, they might require parent information. So that's one set of financial aid that students can apply for um, is based off the FAFSA. The next one is considered merit-based financial aid. And those are our merit scholarships that we offer here at the U, especially like within our office. Um, with the merit-based scholarships, those could be academic, they could be athletic, they could be artistic for departmental awards, but that's the second set of merit-based financial aid that students can receive. Um, on the next slide for the types of financial aid, so when a student fills out a 
a FAFSA form, so Federal Student Financial Aid form, um, they're applying for federal grants, work study, and loans. So it's kind of like one application for all three of those options for a student. Um, we do require the FAFSA for some of our merit scholarships. Um, another part of our merit scholarships is that they don't require a FAFSA. So there's two different options that students can apply for, and we'll get into those in just a little bit. But these are just the types of financial aid a student can possibly receive while they are coming um, to the U for their collegiate career. Um, so for the next slide I want to go into is our federal Pell Grants. Um, so in order for students to possibly receive any type of grants here at the U, um, through our office, they have to, like I said, apply for the FAFSA online. And if they are found eligible, the maximum amount of Pell Grant they could possibly receive is 7395 for the academic year. Um, with that, that amount is for fall and for spring. They could receive half it for fall and the other half for spring, depending on their enrollment tier. So federal Pell Grants, if a student is eligible for their fall semester, um, if they're full-time, they get the full amount for their semester. If they're part-time, they get half of it, three-quarters time, and it kind of goes down from there. So it just prorates as they go down. Um, that Not everyone's eligible for Pell Grant, um, but the students who are, that's the amount they could possibly receive. Um, another type of grant that is offered to some students is called our FSCOG grant. The maximum amount those students can receive is for $1,000 for the year. And kind of the same thing like Pell Grant, it's half for fall and then half for spring, so 500 a semester. That one is based off when students submit their FAFSA to the school, and they're just automatically awarded if they're found eligible based on other criteria that we have. Um, going into our next slide, we have something that's called federal work study. So federal work study is more of a work opportunity to be able to work on campus, um, and it's part of their financial aid package if they're found eligible. Um, also, they can request it if they have found a work study position. So how work study works is that there are certain departments on campus that can only hire students that have a work study position. And so we encourage students who have the work study award to apply for those positions that are on campus. We really encourage students to find positions within their major under a professor if they want to work with someone that they already kind of know because um, they can be teaching assistants, anything like that. And the good thing about the work study program is that it could be any job that's on campus. It could be anything you know, to custodial, to a professor's assistant. So it's a really good opportunity for your student to be able to come to campus, work on campus, um, and just at least be here when while they're doing their studies. Um, the good thing about a federal work study position is that all the departments understand that your student is a student first, that they're not there for the work part, they're there for the student first. So they are very flexible when it comes to midterms, finals, because that's their first priority is that your federal work study student is a student first. Um, with their award, the maximum award they get is 5,000 a year. So it's split half for fall and then half for spring. And they will receive just like a regular paycheck as if they were to work on campus um, at a regular student position. So it's not a grant and it's not a scholarship, but it's more of a work opportunity that they can get up to 5,000 per year, but they receive that every two weeks, just like a weekly um, paycheck for their for federal work study. Um, and so for the next one I want to go over is for federal direct loans. So when a student fills out their FAFSA, um, they are filling it out to possibly receive loans. Loans are only offered to your students. They are not automatically accepted. Um, the two different types of loans that your student can possibly receive is the federal subsidized loan. And the other one is a federal unsubsidized loan. Um, the subsidized loan is where the government pays your student's interest while they are in school and no payments are required till either six months after they graduate or if they're out of school for six consecutive months. Um, the unsubsidized loan is a little bit different. Interest does accrue while your student is in school, but kind of the same thing. They don't have to make any payments till either six months after they graduate or um, unless they're out of school for six consecutive months. So if they decide to take summer off and fall, that's considered six consecutive months and they have to start making payments back in January if they don't start hop back into classes, um, at least at part time. So that's another option for your students. But like I said, it's only offered to your students. Students have to go through additional extra steps in order to accept their loans to pay towards their um, tuition bill. Um, the next thing we're going to go over is the cost of attendance. So if your students have already received a financial aid offer, they probably have already seen their full cost of attendance on their offer file. Um, the cost of attendance is pretty much estimates of their tuition and fees, living expenses, books, courses, and supplies, and equipment, transportation and travel, and also personal or miscellaneous um, and 
personal miscellaneous on their account. The cost of attendance amount is pretty much the maximum amount a student can receive in federal loans, programs, and scholarships within the academic year. Kind of consider it their limit for the full year. Students, if they're accepting any loans, um, they cannot go over that cost of attendance because we it's already been accounted for that they can be successful as a student within that cost of attendance range. Um, we do offer appeals through our office. So if your student has a special circumstance or different situation, situation where they feel their cost sense is higher than what has already been estimated for them, please have them just go ahead and come in, meet with one of our financial aid counselors and they can help them with that amount. Um, next, we're gonna go over federal aid eligibility. So how do you know if your student's eligible um, and how can they even get financial aid? So in order for a student to possibly receive um, federal financial aid, they must meet all three of the following requirements. So they have to have earned a high school diploma or equivalent. They have to be in a degree seeking program here at the U and they have to be a US citizen and eligible non-citizen. If they're not quite sure um, for any of these categories, have like I said, have them come meet with our financial aid counselors and we can help them and kind of make sure they have everything set up so they can possibly apply for the financial aid program. Next on our um, agenda, we're gonna go over financial aid basics. So if this is some of your students' first time um, coming here to the U, it's your, you know, it's, you don't have any other students ever gone to college. So what is FAFSA? Like what are the basics and what does it cover and how does it help your students? So the FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid that kind of, like I said before, will have them apply for either federal Pell Grants, work study um, and loans, and then possible scholarships that are available here at the school. Um, students are not required to fill out a FAFSA. It is an option for them. We would always encourage students to fill out the FAFSA just so they don't miss out on any opportunities that kind of come their way. Um, the FAFSA does take some time to fill out a little bit, but we just always encourage students to fill it out at the beginning. And then if they don't need it later in the academic year, um, then they don't have to accept anything if they don't want to. Um, but like I said, we always encourage them to because we always see opportunities pop up for like need-based scholarships across campus. Um, and we want all the students to be able to be eligible to apply for those. Um, a newer FAFSA is required to be completed every year if they want to possibly receive it. So if you have a student who is Pell Grant eligible and they want loans every academic year, they have to apply for it because it goes off of two years prior of the tax data. So as you, as you know, tax data is different every single year. So they have to apply for it every single year. Um, this FAFSA for this year opened up a little bit later, but then next year it should open up in October. And so it kind of gives students a full year to be able to submit all their documentation to be able to see what they are possibly eligible for, for the FAFSA. Um, on the next slide for with financial aid offers. So once your student has filled out the FAFSA, done everything, this is kind of the timeline that your students will be able to receive their financial aid offers. So your student would go online to studentaid.gov and submit their FAFSA to the Department of Education. The Department of Education goes through and reviews all the FAFSA data and then sends it out to the school. Um, once it gets to the school, that's where we have to determine if we need additional information from your student or the parent um, and just request and maybe some additional documentation. Um, after we've received that and everything pretty much is good to go, then we will send your offer letter to your student. Um, all offer letters are sent to your student's email account. So if you have a student who hasn't set up their email, we would encourage them to do so because that's the only way we can really communicate with your student is through their university mail account. So that's about financial aid. So now let's go into a little bit more about our scholarship program that we have here at the U. So with scholarships, our university merit scholarships are for first time, first year freshmen. And in order for students to be considered for merit scholarships, they have to have a completed admissions application by December 1st. So for this upcoming fall semester, all students need that completed by December 1st, 2023. And then notifications were sent out on February 1st for your eligible students who met the merit criteria. Um, in order for students to possibly receive a merit scholarship, um, we looked at them based off of their high school course rigor and their GPA at the time of their admissions application. Um, if students are eligible to receive it, they are for eight semesters, so for four years, um, or until they finish their bachelor's degree program here at the U. So those are kind of the first um, steps in order to receive a merit scholarship. Um, the next one I wanna go into is our for Utah scholarship. So the For Utah scholarship is a newer program that we have here at the U and it ensures um, 
four years of tuition and mandatory fees that are covered by grants and scholarships for Utah residents who are, who are Pell Grant eligible. So in order for students to qualify for this one for this fall, same thing, they had to have met the December 1st deadline um, for their admi completed admissions application. They must be a Utah resident and they must have submitted a 24-25 FAFSA by August 1st. So we still have some time. So if your students meet those first few criteria, please have them go ahead and submit their FAFSA so that they can possibly meet that August 1st deadline to possibly be eligible for the four Utah scholarship. Um, in addition to that, once they have submitted their FAFSA, they have to be Pell Grant eligible in order to be part of the four Utah program. They have to be Pell Grant eligible each year in order to get it. Um, and then with that, they have to have a minimum unweighted high school GPA of a 3.2 at the time of their admissions application in December. So those are some of the requirements um, for the four Utah scholarships. Like I said, if your students haven't filled out a FAFSA yet, but they meet everything else, go ahead and have them completed online um, at studentaid.gov. The next scholarship we're going to go into is our Western Undergraduate Exchange Tuition Discount Award, which we also call our WUI Scholarship. Um, WUI scholarship is considered a merit, merit scholarship here at the U, and that is determined by the Office of Admissions. Um, so in order to be eligible for students to get WUI, they have to be a first-time, first-year freshman. Um, they have to be a permanent resident of a WUI state or U.S. territory, and they have to have a cumulative unweighted high school GPA of 3.3 at the time of application um, back in December. So all of our WUI students who have, were found eligible based on their application were notified on January 15th of their offer for WUI. Um, but if you have any questions about your student status or if you if you think your student qualifies, um, but you're not quite sure why they didn't get anything, um, please go ahead and reach out to the Office of Admissions. They are more than happy to help kind of look through your student's file and see what, um, what they can possibly help you with. Um, with the next slide, along with the WUI Tuition Discount Award, it brings up some conversations about residency and what's better. So in order for students to um, apply for residency, they cannot be on the WUI um, tuition discount award. So sometimes residency might be a better option for students. So if your student would like to pursue residency, we would encourage them to reach out to the residency office and they can give you set up with a residency counselor to help them determine if they want to pursue residency and not have the WUI or just stay on WUI and see if that's a better route for them. Um, that's the email for the residency's office along with their phone number. So please feel free to reach out to them um, if you have any questions related to residency and kind of what's going to be a better um, option for your student. Um, the next on our slide or on our presentation, we want to talk about departmental scholarships. So our office does the merit scholarships, like the merit campus-based scholarships, but your students can also apply for other specific departmental scholarships. Departments all across campus have different funding and they have different requirements. And so we encourage students to go online to our utah.academicworks webpage where all our departments post their scholarship applications on that website. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop for our students to be able to apply for departmental scholarships. Um, having them be departmental, they might be specific where they have to be a certain major, a certain GPA in order to receive it. But there are some scholarships on there where they are for every major, for every type of student, they just need students to apply and kind of, you know, fill out their application for there. So the good thing about departmental scholarships is that they actually are available all year round. Um, they We encourage students within our office that come in and meet with us that we encourage them to look it up um, at least once a month because new scholarships could pop up at any point within a department and we want to make sure they're not missing out on those opportunities. Um, we also encourage the students to go meet with their departmental academic advisors to see if there's any scholarships within the department that they can apply for that might be coming and opening up soon, just so they can, like make, like I said, make sure that they're not missing out on any opportunity that they're possible for. So this is a great website for your students to go to. Um, again, it's utah.academicworks.com. Um, and so that concludes um, my section of the presentation. So this is our office information. We do walk-in appointments. Um, we are more than happy to, to sit down with students and parents to go over their financial aid file or go over their scholarships. So this is our contact information. Feel free to email us or call us. Um, those are the office hours that we're pretty much open. We're open eight to five, Monday through Friday, except for Tuesdays, we open at 10. So like I said, encourage everybody to call. I know school's coming up here um, in the next few weeks. So we just wanna make sure everyone has the opportunity to talk to our office if needed, so.
Ashley, I have a few questions that have yeah. come in. Um, one, a couple of people have asked is just timing from FAFSA when they fill out the FAFSA information to when they get their offer. So usually once a student submits their FAFSA online, it's usually about two to three business days until we receive it like in a perfect world. So with the delay of the FAFSA this year, it might be a little longer, like more like three to five. Um, and depending on the student situation, um, it might be a little bit longer than that. So if your student applies for FAFSA today, definitely have them call our office in two to three business days and we can let them know if they're kind of on track to get an offer letter by next week or the week after, and we can kind of help them gauge that. But usually it's like two to three or three to five business days. Okay. And if it's been longer than that, they should just reach out to you. Yeah. And information here. Yeah, exactly. Just there, just with the Department of Education delay, there are certain accounts that we can work on. Um, and there's other ones we have to wait for them to kind of give us the, the green light to work on. So just have them call just so we can give a realistic timeline for the student. Okay. And then um, it, how do they get notified about federal work study? Is that the same way as they get notified of um, scholarships and financial aid? Yeah, it's actually on the offer letter. So if you have a student that when they get their offer letter for financial aid, it should be on there. If not, on our website on financialaid.utah.edu, under our form section, there is a work study request form. So if your student has got their offer letter and they don't see work study on there, but they have found a work study position, go ahead and have them fill out that work study request form. And then our work study manager will be able to go through and notify them to see if they really are eligible for work study or not. So there is a form if they don't see it on there. Okay. Um, are there jobs on campus available for students other than federal work study opportunities? Yes. So there are federal work study positions and they're also regular um, student based positions. Usually within an office, you, they might not know the difference. Just the funding is coming from a different source. So yeah, there's definitely both for all type of students on campus for sure. Okay, great. Um, do stu will students be getting an official cost of attendance letter? And will this note merit scholarships that haven't been awarded yet? Um, some people haven't received anything yet. So the cost of attendance, that's a great question. So the cost of attendance is available online. If you go to our website, we do have every major, well, every type of groups or student groups cost pens available. If your student hasn't received their official cost pendants, that's usually probably because they haven't received their official offer letter just quite yet, but the cost of attendance is available online for all students. So when you go onto our website, it will say like undergraduate resident, undergraduate non-resident, and then we'll give you that cost of attendance on there. Okay. Um, if somebody's moving to Utah and should gain residency next year uh, and they are a Pell Grant recipient, will they be eligible to apply for a uh, for Utah scholarship next year or maybe a WUI scholarship? Unfortunately, no. So when we're when we're talking about the time of application, we look at it at what their status was on December 1st of 2023. So if they were considered a non-resident on that time, our scholarships are only for first time first year freshmen, um, or they're considered transfer students. So especially for the four Utah one, you needed to be a Utah resident at that time. Same thing for WUI, you need to be a non-resident from a WUI state at that time in order to be eligible for those ones. Okay. Um, if somebody's applied for a parent plus loan or a private loan through Sally Mayer College Avenue, how long does it take to fund and cover tuition and living? So we usually the entire process from when a parent has applied for like a private loan or a plus loan, usually it's three to four weeks only because the private entities require a 14 day um, right to cancellation period. So it kind of takes a little bit of time. So as long as you've done everything with your lender and they send it to the school, then we just actually can't disperse any students, federal aid, private loans, scholarships until the first week of school. So when the bills come out, um, here in a few weeks and you don't see the private loan on there, you don't see any of that, it's because those we can't disperse any of that funding until the first week of school. But yeah, usually about three to four weeks for the private loans. Okay, great. Um, what, if somebody's received a WUI um, scholarship, it will automatically be applied to the tuition bill, right? Correct, yep, the first so week of school. there's nothing they need to do. Right. Okay, great. Um, is there a separate application for the WUI? No, that's a part of their admissions application. So once students apply for admissions back in December, and then again for like this December, um, that's considered their merit application because WUI is considered a merit scholarship. 
Okay. Um, if somebody's deferred and had a merit scholarship that they have been told would carry over, when should they see that? So as long as so our policy is that as long as your student has an official admissions deferment through the admissions office and it's been approved, or your student has a, an official leave of absence through the registrar's office, as long as those are approved and granted to them, we honor that and we will hold it till whenever they get back. So pretty much if you consider the deferral approved, then our office will get a notification from admissions and then we will hold it for them when they get back. The only um, caveat to that is that if your student decides to extend or come back early, just have them talk to us directly just so we can make those updates on their account. Okay, great. Um, since school's starting here coming up on August 19th, when should they panic if they haven't received an award letter yet, knowing that FAFSA is a little bit behind schedule? Right. We are, so right now we are packaging a lot of students. So your, your students, if they haven't been packaged or sent an offer letter yet, have them check in the next three to five business days because we are, we just kind of got the clearance to package a bunch of them coming through. Um, I would say if your student hasn't received anything, honestly, by August 1st, by August 1st, majority of the students who are eligible to receive federal financial aid should have an offer out. So I would say kind of August 1st, um, it, like if you want to check it beforehand, like I said, feel free to call or come in. We have a ton of counselors that can help them through that process or see where they're at in the timeline. Okay, great. Um, are there any recommended lenders? There's a lot of different uh, lending options out there. Um, how, how do they get kind of some recommendations on lenders? We, so we can't actually recommend any lenders out there. We encourage students to go to their personal banks first because they know them the most. And then after that, it will kind of be independent research on their own for the student just because we can't recommend any lenders on our end. Sorry. Okay. Um, are there still merit scholarships that have not been notified yet? No, all of our merit applications went out on February 1st. Okay, but the department scholarships are still... Right, yeah, so uh, those are still, they're still going out with all their offers um, to their eligible students. Okay, um, and then um, the, there's another question about WUI. So WUI is automatically applied. Um, is it automatically renewed as well? No. So all students who receive a merit scholarship through our office, they are sent their terms and conditions that outline what's required of them in order to have it be renewed each academic year. So for WUI specifically, it's a 3.0 and they have to be full time each semester and complete 24 credit hours. So if your student does have a merit scholarship and it's not WUI, it might be presidents, academic, flagship, have them go online to our website and look at the terms and conditions so they know what's required of them each year in order to keep um, getting their award. We don't look at renewal until the end of spring semester. So if your student, for example, has WUI and they come in the fall and they have like a 2.9, they miss it a little bit, that's fine. They'll still get it for spring. We just won't check it until the end of spring. So have them kind of bring up their GPA a little bit. Okay. And um, if, if they're going to apply for a department award, should they meet with a, a department advisor or a counselor before doing that? Or should they just go ahead and apply for those? I, I would encourage students just to apply just because there are deadlines on those applications. So if you can't get in with an advisor till a certain date, you just don't want to miss out on that application. So I would say apply. But if you definitely have follow-up questions and follow up with the department to kind of make sure that if there's anything else that you need or you can kind of get a timeline from them on when they're going to actually notify their um, scholars for their awards. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ashley. You're we're going to now go to, and there might be questions at the end for yeah, you, for sure. but we're, we're going to go now to Henry. I've got a couple of questions that I actually think your presentation is going to answer about some uh, tuition timing and things like that. So um, Henry's going to talk about um, tuition. Yeah, I am. Uh, my name is Henry. I run the desk where you pay tuition in person. And I'm hoping that with this presentation, I will never have to see any of you and you won't have to see me and you won't have to see the line that's going to be going out the door come the January or not the January, the August due date for tuition. So uh, this presentation will help cover how you're supposed to pay tuition and where you're going to be seeing your bill. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide for me. So the first place you want to be looking is in your student's CIS page. Uh, you'll be able to go into your student homepage and click on the tuition and loans tile. And that's what's going to provide a lot of the information that we'll cover today. If you're a parent, you'll want to log in with your student 
uh, to this service as the parent does not have access to this naturally. So the tuition bill is gonna be sent out on August 1st. Uh, as of right now, then charges are not finalized. However, on August 1st, you'll be able to see the total for the amount that your student has signed up for in their classes. Uh, there's no physical bill that's sent out. It is viewed online, but you can see it here in tuition and loans on your student's homepage uh, under your tuition history. Uh, the place we will go to remind you if your tuition still isn't paid will be your email. So like our previous presenter said, if you leave with nothing else, leave with the knowledge that your email is maybe the most important thing uh, that you have access to. That's where we'll send every piece of official correspondence if tuition is upcoming and due. If you don't remember a date, but you still, or post this presentation, you don't remember how to access your tuition. All of that can and will be communicated to you as reminders on your email. So the tuition due date for fall is going to be on August 30th. So the bill will be available on the 1st and the uh, required payment date will be on the 30th. You have two options, generally speaking. One is to pay it in full by that amount. The other is to have a payment plan set up by the 30th, uh, which I believe will be my next slide. So go ahead and uh, move on for me. Oh, well, no, perfect. As far as the logistics of paying, there is almost no downside to paying online. You'll go into your tuition and loans tile in your student homepage and simply click view and pay accounts. After August 1st, the balance will be there available to pay. If you pay by card online, there is a $3 convenience fee. Uh, I have parents stressed at the window every year that we're charging 3%. No, it is half the price of coffee. I find it very worth it. Um, and that's our recommended method for paying your tuition. The other option is to come see me, um, which you will not have as much fun with. Uh, but I would, you know, we can meet, we can chat, and we can get your tuition taken care of at the window if you need to pay by check. As far as 529s go, if you have a 529 savings account set up for your student, you'll want to contact that company. They will then reach out to the university uh, and either send us a check or a wire, depending on their, like, individual strategy. Uh, but if you have a 529, you will want to start that conversation with that company rather than with the university. Uh, you'll simply wait to get your billing uh, on August 1st. You'll be able to view your tuition and you'll request that amount from your 529 savings account. Okay, perfect. For parents who want to pay on their student's account uh, and want to do it individually, then you can go with your student and have them set you up as an authorized payer. So you'll go into your student homepage, into tuition and loans, and view and pay accounts. And there will be an option there where they can set you up to view housing and tuition charges, make payments, or set up a payment plan. Uh, you do not have to be on a payment plan to be an authorized payer. You just have to be authorized by the student uh, online. You can go ahead to the next. Our monthly payment plan is one of our more popular options to pay tuition. There is the five month and the four month plan. The important thing to remember about both of these is that they both end on the same date of December 22nd. But basically, if you sign up for a payment plan between now and July 20th, so three days, you'll be on the five month plan. Uh, at that point, you'll only have an estimate of your tuition to work with that you can get from the tuition estimator online. The other option and the one most people go with is the four month payment plan where after August 1st, you'll have your bill, you'll go into your tuition and loans tile and payment and payment plans. You'll be able to simply drop your tuition balance into that payment plan and split it up across four payments. The first one is due, 
when you sign up for the plan as the first payment. And then it'll come out on the 22nd of each month afterwards. As long as the payment plan is set up by the 30th of August, you're all good. Uh, and that's everything I have for the payment plan. There is important things to keep in mind as far as a failure payment. If you know that the payment plan's automatic billing isn't going to go through, come talk to us and we can help rebalance or fix or adjust your payment plan as is necessary for you. Because if when we try to bill it, then there is insufficient funds in the account, you'll end up with a $30 uh, payment, like failed payment fee that we don't want you to have. Uh, so if you are running into any problems and know you're not going to be able to pay tuition, come speak to us and we can work something out with you. Uh, if you fail multiple times in a row, the payment plan will simply be canceled uh, with a larger $75 late fee. You can go after. As far as another option, this one is more niche and we don't recommend it to everyone, but our office does offer a short-term loan. It has a $15 application fee with a credit check. And we recommend this for students who can pay their tuition in full, but simply need maybe a week or two post the deadline. I only say that because this loan through our office is not designed for any long-term uh, applications because it's due in full by October 15th. Uh, after that, it will be accruing interest at the rate of 1% per month. So this is an option if you simply need a few more weeks to pay the tuition in full. Most students will either be signing up for a payment plan or paying the tuition by the deadline anyway. If your tuition is not paid or there is not a payment plan in place uh, after August 30th, we will end up dropping your students' classes. There are a few people who are exempt from this. If you have a Pell Grant or other federal financial aid, your classes are held automatically and you don't have to worry. However, if you're paying past the deadline, then you're gonna have to worry about your classes being removed from your schedule, uh, after which it's a much more complicated process with admissions and our office to get them re-added uh, and so the takeaway here is that to pay your tuition, you'll want to do you'll want to do it by August 30th, and to pay your tuition after the deadline is going to get a lot more complicated and more expensive for the student with additional fees. As far as your financial aid works, it's going to automatically be applied to your account. That's already been reviewed. Uh, if you have any additional questions. Around that, Ashley is going to end up being a better resource than me, but I can give you some. For example, if you pay your tuition in full and then there is a scholarship that applies to the account and you're eligible for a refund, we will refund the original payment method that you used uh, to get you your money back. And then if you're a parent trying to come to the window or speak to us on the phone, you'll want to set up a FERPA PIN number with your student. That's something that they do online in their, student, in their CIS. And in order for me to give any parent information about their student's account, their student has to authorize it. Uh, the Family Education Right to Privacy Act is something that the university takes very seriously. It's required by law. We cannot give out any information on a student's account without this PIN number. Uh, or authorization to give you that information. So if you're a parent and you want to consistently be helping your student along in the process, be coming to the window and speaking to us, this is something very important to uh, take into account because I cannot tell you the tuition balance of your student unless I have the authorization to. Uh, I briefly went over this before, but if the student is ever due a refund, then they can simplify the process by setting up direct deposit uh, under their CIS in tuition loans. Uh, the, it just simply means that if we have to send you out a check, instead you do not have to wait the two to three weeks for it to go in the mail, you will wait the two days for it to be deposited directly into your account. 
uh, it is easier. You will love it so much more. I, on a daily basis, have to return lost checks to people, uh, and it's a much, much bigger headache for a check to be lost in the mail than it is to be deposited into your account. Uh, some final reminders is that direct deposit will make your life easier every day of every day of the week. Go ahead, do that right now. Go ahead and make sure you have access to your email. And for you parents, make sure you have access to a FERPA pin. All three of these things are going to enable you to fix any problems you find in the future. So Henry, we have a couple of questions. I'll let you, uh, Give your contact info. Is there any? No, this uh, this QR code is going to be the best option for accessing any of this information online. And then the contact info at the Bursars, uh, that 801-581-7344, that rings all of our accountants and we'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, the phone lines get busy next month. Go ahead and ask the questions today, tomorrow, next week. Try not to do it in August. Your life is worse in August. <laughs> okay, great. Um, somebody said that they saw that they're supposed to give notice of how we're paying our tuition on July 22nd. Does I that saw that question. Familiar? I think you may have been, I think there may have been an issue that you saw information about the five month payment plan, which has its first payment on July 22nd. You do not need to give notice of how to pay tuition by then. The only deadline that you need to be concerned about with tuition is August 30th. Okay, great. Is there a way to have the 529 plan paid directly to the university? Yes, there is. The 529, it can pay for housing as well as tuition. You'll just go ahead and contact them with the full balance of those, and they will cut the check to the university. Okay. Um, so you do that through the 529 plan? Yes, you do. Okay. If you take out a private loan, will the loan payment automatically be sent to the bursar's office to cover tuition, or is it sent directly to the student and then they pay it? Private loans are inherently harder to answer because every company will do it differently. However, the majority, the vast majority of private loans do pay out to the university as long as it's a student loan. Uh, if you're taking any other type of loan, it's better to ask the company, but generally speaking, they pay to the university. Okay. Um, is there a fee to do the payment plan? $35. Okay. Um, if someone's offered an FDL unsub loan in the financial aid statement, where do they go to apply? I think Ashley will be a better resource, but as far as I'm aware, financial aid tile in your student homepage. Okay, Ashley? Yeah, no, Henry's exactly right. So your student's loan is offered to you, um, but in their financial aid status page, like Henry said, there is an acceptance drop down that they can do and they'll go ahead and accept their loans there. Um, if they're not able to find that, then we also have a loan request form on our forms page that they can fill out as well. Okay, um, and then the address for the 529 to be sent, is that right here in the bursar's office address? Yep, uh, that's the one you should give your company. Okay, so it's right here, 201 South, 1460 East, room 165, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84112-9054. Um, okay, if refunds are made by the direct deposit, does it go to the student's account or the party who paid tuition? It's whatever account the direct deposit set up for. Um, if you're a parent and you work it out with your student, you can collaborate and set it up for the parent's account or you can set it up for the student's account. Uh, the one thing that I'll note is that if anybody makes a credit card payment, um, then that credit card needs to be refunded first. And so it will not interact with a direct deposit. What you were saying about whether it will go to another party, if you, if you as a parent make a $3,000 payment on the student's account, and then the student is uh, eligible for a $600 refund, that $600 is going back to the original card that paid the tuition inherently. If you pay 3,000 by check, on the other hand, that $600 refund would go to whatever direct deposit is set up on the account. 
Okay, great. Um, if an outside scholarship is received and sent to the university, will it automatically be posted to the student's account and reflected on the balance due? Yeah, with some time of processing, that's how it'll work. Okay. Okay, great. And that's why if those come after the tuition due date, that's where you get the refund. Yes. Okay. And then what kinds of credit cards do that does the university accept? Visa, Amex, excuse me, there's something in my throat. Uh, Discover, uh, all good. MasterCard, the big four. Okay. Great. Um, if you have other questions, we'll um, handle those at the end. We're going to turn it over to Elsa now, and she's going to talk about some resources that we have for financial wellness. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So my name is Elsa Osborne. I am the program coordinator here at the Financial Wellness Center. I'm also one of our financial counselors in the office. Um, so we kind of help with um, a variety of things, but go to the next, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, I'll cover that in a minute. So for today, we're gonna give a program overview of our center and then what does financial wellness mean um, and how can we support students' financial well-being? So yeah, we'll cover um, about us and then we'll briefly talk about some financial foundations like budgeting and paying for school, um, just to give a sneak peek of what we can help students with, but it'll mostly be an overview of the services we offer. Um, yeah, so our mission is to support student well-being and success um, by providing financial counseling, education, programming, research, and advocacy to guide students in their lifelong financial wellness journeys. Um, some of our services, our biggest one is the one-on-one -on -one financial counseling. We also offer one-on-one -on -one credit counseling, which is a super, super cool resource. Um, and then monthly programming and some workshops and then not annual acts clinics, annual tax clinics, so sorry. Um, so we can help students file their taxes each spring. Um, a lot of times we get asked, what the heck is financial counseling? I think the easiest way to explain it is it's almost like therapy, but for money. And when I tell people that, they're like, well, who wouldn't want that? It's a really great resource. And um, our team, um, most of our full-time staff are accredited financial counselors or becoming an accredited financial counselor. And then we also do peer counseling too. Um, we have really great student staff. So Yes, those are our main services. So what is financial wellness? Um, the easiest way to explain it is you've got this wellness wheel. Um, there's these nine aspects of wellness. And I kind of explain it as like if if you get a flat tire, right, and you're on a trip, that affects your, your destination and how you keep going. So if we're talking about this analogy, we'd have like graduating or getting through school. And if one of these areas is off, then that's going to affect things. So I think it's really awesome that the center exists and, and there's so many centers here that support student well-being and success and we're one of them. Um, so yeah, we're here to help students on their, um, on that aspect of financial wellness. So, um, some some questions to ask and that students can keep in mind, like, what do you prioritize? How do you prioritize these aspects of wellness? And then what does financial wellness mean to you? Okay, so again, I can't cover everything that we do in all of these, but we can help students on their financial journeys. Um, gosh, I'm so sorry about the formatting. Anyways, um, there's these eight kind of key things Six of them are um, the evidence-based things students can work on while in college. And then we added two, we added debt payoff and then taxes because we felt those were important too. But um, yeah, that that's kind of the journey. And I'm going to go over a little bit of them again to give you a sneak peek. But those are the areas. Yes. So building your financial foundation. Um I think we're like, where where do we start? So these are some, some great places to start. Define your financial values and goals and then create 
um, a spending plan, aka a budget that aligns with your financial values and goals. And the fun thing with this one is I think just about everyone here values getting an education. And so that's a great goal to start with. And then um, prioritize that, prioritize paying for school. Um, when it comes down to it, there are three main ways to pay for school. Um, and Ashley and Henry have given a great background, which is why I love that this webinar exists. I think it's cool to collaborate. But so someone else's money and then your own money and borrowed money. Um, so we kind of go in that order. So someone else's money would be um, family support or um, scholarships and grants, things that you don't have to pay back. Um, and then your own money, that's your budget. So how can you increase income or lower your expenses or a combination of the two? Um, and we help a lot with that one. Um, yes. And then borrowed money is the third, and that would be student loans. Um, and again, have your student meet with us. Um, I was going to say students. I, I went to school and I have a twin, so I'm used to saying students, but student, um, or maybe you do have more than one kid at school, but um, borrowed money. So that's um, could be federal loans or private. And kind of like Ashley said, we don't refer either to a specific like private company, but we we can help students look at the options and evaluate um, any any credit products. Financial counselors do that, like helping helping people see like, OK, what are the pros and cons of this one or would this one work for my situation or is there one that would work better? So we can kind of talk through those things. OK, you can go to the next one. So um some budgeting basics and again I can't go budgeting I could spend a whole hour just on budgeting but I wanted to provide this just to get you started if your student is really eager to start start creating a spending plan um and this QR code will take you to the FWC financial planner um our director, Dr. McAllister made this and it's I put a picture in there but it's super fun it We'll create like a te template you can put in like, okay, this is how much my tuition is going to cost, or maybe I'm on a payment plan and here's when it's due. Um, yeah, I love helping students like with their financial organization. I think there can be so much, so much information and like having it written down in one place can be really helpful. And then these are kind of the steps to do that. Um, yes, you can go to the next one. Um so to add on to that, some financial milestones, because um, again, I think managing money can be hard sometimes. And so when we break it down, these are some main things to keep in mind. So emergency funds. And again, this can be modified for students. Maybe students have family support. Um, and so that's a discussion to have with with your family, right? Like what would be expected of me if an emergency happens? And then we can talk about debt payoff, um, especially for when they get closer to graduation, creating a plan to pay off any student loans. Um, and then investing in debt. So many students are are so eager to to start investing. So we can we talk about that too. Um, and then goals. This one's really fun. Achieving your short, medium, and long-term goals. Um, I yeah, I love seeing what what different goals students have. Um, and we, I guess, a big question that we get a lot is like, can we only help with budgeting for school? We we can help with that, and we can help fit in other goals too. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so. Um, Staying in touch with us. Um, this is our link tree, and then that's our Instagram. Um, we try and post things on Instagram, so that's a great way to stay connected with us. Um, book have your student book a one-on-one -on -one with us. Um, they can meet with a peer mentor, or if they'd rather meet with um, me or one of our other full-time staff financial counselors, they can um, email us too at our email, and I'll that's on the next slide. But yeah, we also have these events for the fall, um, our programming that complement one-on-ones. Um, so you could take a picture, send this to your student. Um, yeah, we're here to support them. So 
Um, we have a newsletter too. So that's, and parents, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's, it's fun. And yes. Okay. Next slide. Okay. And then, yeah, please, please stay in, in touch. We're here to support students. Um, and money can be hard sometimes, so they don't have to do it alone. Um, we're in the union room 317, um, and we do virtual appointments too, if that's better for your student. Um, and then our Instagram at U of U underscore financial wellness. Um, and then our email financial wellness at sa.utah.edu. And then our website is financialwellness.utah.edu. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Elsa. Um, I'm going to bring Henry and Ashley back. So I just have a couple of final questions. Um, and first, I want to thank all of you. This is really, really good information. For those of you who haven't been here um, from the start, some people are at work and things like that, we did record this and it is available at belong.utah.edu and it's going to be in the webinar section there. So you will be able to go back, read it again, look at the slides slides, take pictures of slides that you need. Um, okay, uh, question, are there scholarships for unmet needs? So usually, well, so I, I assume you're, con or you're meaning need-based aid or need-based scholarships. So students who are considered high need, which is related to unmet need, those are considered need-based scholarships. And those are not through our office necessarily, they're through departmental scholarships is where they'll find those ones. Okay. Um, there's also resources for students who, um, you know, ha have concerns or issues or need emergency funds or things like that. And so um, those uh, can, if you go to our website, you can find information about uh, some of those. We have the Basic Needs Collective. We've got a um, uh, a food pantry, you know, things like that that are available on campus. So lots of things once students get here in August, lots of things to explore. And there's a lot of people that can kind of point them in the direction they need with questions they have. So any of their advisors can do that, their resident, uh, their RA, if they're in housing. So lot, lots of people can help there. If you want to go to belong.utah.edu, there's a place that they can type in a question that they have, and then we can uh, reach out and connect them to those resources. Um, I have a question that says we received a letter that says we have determined your initial eligibility for federal state financial aid. Is that an offer letter? And if it is, then who do they contact? I would have them contact our office because usually with the offer letter, it will say the amount. So just have them contact our office and then we can help them through that process for it. Okay, and I think, can you go over again, Ashley, just the timeline, because FAFSA is a little bit um, but behind again? Yeah, so right now when we're packaging all students, um, technically if your student doesn't have a financial aid offer by August 1, then definitely have them come to our office. If they've already submitted a FAFSA, they've checked their CIS account online to see if there's any additional documents we need. Sometimes we have students who submit a FAFSA, but then the Department of Education requires us to check um, like additional information, like asset information or their taxes from the previous year. And sometimes students have said that they have applied like back in May, but they haven't got the offer letter, but it's because we're waiting on your student to take action. So I would have your students all check their online accounts and CIS, see if there's anything else they need to do to get the offer. If they go on there, everything's completed, but they don't have the offer, have them call our office and we can let them know um, when they can expect that offer. Okay, great. Well, that's all the questions we have. Again, the place to get the um, the tape of the webinar is belong.utah.edu slash webinar. Um, and then um, that will take you, this one, it'll take us about a day to get it uploaded. So you might see last year's on there. We'll be replacing last year's with this year's information. And so um, it takes us just about a day to upload that. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Ashley. Henry, Elsa, we appreciate this really important information, and we want to thank you all for attending. We're very excited to welcome students on campus in just a month's time. So classes start in just a little bit over a month. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it, and have a great rest of your day.